Good morning. It is 10 a.m. on August 22, 2023. We'll call to meet order the meeting of the Story County Board of Supervisors. Please stand with me if you're able and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> It's on. It's on. Do I have a motion to adopt today's agenda? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Merkin. Aye. Pedens. Aye. Basil. Aye. Now it's time for public comment number one. This comment period is for the public to address topics on today's agenda. Anyone wishing to make public comment, you can step forward to the table or raise your hand on Zoom. <clears throat> Seeing no one step forward to raise their hand, we'll close public comment number one. We have no agency reports today. So moving to consideration of proclamation recognizing August 31st as International Overdose Awareness Day. Uh, Supervisor Merkin, would you like to start? Yes. Whereas International Overdose Awareness Day is recognized globally on August 31st to raise awareness about the risks of overdosing, honor the special someone whose life has been lost from overdosing, and acknowledge the grief felt by families, friends, and communities around the world. And whereas Overdose Awareness Day aims to publicly challenge the stigma associated with substance abuse disorders and overdosing. And whereas the mission of the mili military order of the Purple Heart is to foster an environment of goodwill among combat, I think we have a mixed up proclamation here. I'm not sure how that happened. One moment. Can we come back to the proclamation? We can. Yeah, we'll come back to the proclamation. Uh, moving to consideration of minutes from August 15, 2023. I move approval of minutes as presented. Second. Moved and seconded. Hedens. Aye. Merkin. Aye. Basil. Aye. Consideration of personnel actions. I move approval of personnel actions as presented. Second. Moved and seconded. Merkin. Aye. Hedens. Aye. Basil. Aye. Consent agenda. I move approval of consent agenda items as listed. Second. Moved and seconded. Hedens. Aye. Merkin. Aye. Basil. Aye. <clears throat> we have no public hearing items today. Moving to additional items, we have discussion and consideration of resolution 24-15, bridge embargo, that vehicle and load limit be established and signs be erected advising permissible maximum weight on the bridges listed. Good morning, Darren. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this item pretty straightforward. We do this every two years. Uh, we get our bridges inspected every two years and the results of those um, inspections uh, require we load posts and more bridges. Uh, just a couple quick stats. Uh, the good news is uh, in 2021, we had 114 load posted and we dropped down to 107. Uh, so we uh, dropped seven off of the list. In 2021, we added over 40 because of some load posting changes by the legislature. Uh, so that was our a big change last time, but we actually went down this time. So that's good news. And then uh, we still have eight closed bridges on the list that stayed the same we didn't close any additional bridges in the past two years uh, we leave those closed bridges on there for 10 years because we get credit for those bridges in the bridge funding formula after 10 years we will completely remove them from the list if we have no plans to reopen them um, with that any other questions uh, recommend approval any questions <clears throat> I would entertain a motion. I move approval. Second. Moved and seconded. Merkin. Aye. Hedens. Aye. Basil. Aye. Moving next to discussion and consideration of utility permit. Yes, we had a uh, utility permit come in. Generally, they're uh, private companies or public entities. And this one happened to be a, a private individual that wants to put uh, over a thousand feet of water line in the road right of way. 
Um, I do have con some concerns with this. The first step when a home gets built, they go through planning development, get a permit. Um, when that happened, they ask how they're going to supply the water. And at that point, their attorney indicated they'd be getting rural water. Um, I was notified a couple weeks ago that uh, now they are considering getting the water from the city of Huxley. Um, and they wanted the private homeowner to own the line. And I tried to talk them out of that and said it'd be much better if the city owned it. Um, I don't think it's good to have a private individual in charge of the one calls. They're going to have to register the whole line with one call and they're going to have to have somebody to locate it every time um, we do work out there or another utility comes in to do work. Um, if it's hit, you're going to have a homeowner, one very upset homeowner without water, and then it's going to be up to them to get it fixed. And I don't think most homeowners are equipped to do something like that in a quick fashion. Um, and then my biggest concern in the, is in the future. If this house sells, the unknowing homeowner is not going to know they're responsible for a thousand feet of water line. Um, so that is my biggest concern about future um, issues. And Is there more uh, development proposed in this area or likely? I believe so. Um, I think the city does have plans to annex out this way in the future, but I don't know how long that's going to take. Um, Chris Gardner is the the builder. He was going to try to hop on the board meeting today. I don't. So can we go back to the rural water? Is that yeah? Is that not a possibility? Apparently, we don't show rural water. There's a number of homes on Oak Boulevard. Um, we don't show any rural water in the area and the cities indicated they have supplied water lines out to these homes in the past. I have no record of that, which is kind of scary because um, when we do one calls, they won't show up and if we hit them. It's already going to be a problem, but uh, I checked and a lot of those homes were built in the forties and the 1960s. So they've been there a long time. I don't know how long the water lines have been there, but um, this is an, so they're, in, right of, no they're in our right away. I, I'm not even sure where they are. And what what would be the reason of not working with the city? Does did the city say no? At this point, they preferred the private homeowner to own the line. Oh, the city does. Yeah. Oh. Okay. But uh, they said it wasn't. They would entertain owning it if they had to, but. That was the last resort. So I tried to request that they submit it that way and they did not want to do that. So so is the cities, I get it's kind of their last resort. Is there reluctance because they aren't annexed out that far? I don't know what the reluctance is. They just probably don't want to own the line, take responsibility for it. But uh, I think that's a much better situation, in my opinion. <laughs> But they said they said rural water on their permit. Origi originally, yes. Originally. Yeah. Had they not checked it out? That I don't have information on. It, I think once, once the city allows rural water to supply, then, the, then they have to do, they kind of, I don't know the rules behind that, but I think once they allow them to come in, then they have to eventually buy them out. Um, yeah, they, they lose do. their water rights. Yeah, they do. Ames has had that mm -hmm. issue along Cameron Road. Mm -hmm. um, it. So I don't know the background on why they switched, but. Uh... Maybe if Chris is on, can you tell if somebody else is online that wouldn't be anybody else on there. I, just, I don't know who HNN is. So. I agree with raise your, their hand or yeah. whatever on there to. I, I agree with your concerns. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think.
think it's a city line should be owned by the city. I think you have valid concerns about future. I can reach back out to the city and tell them to resubmit with the city ownership. And um, I see no reason to uh, not allow that. But uh, in this case, I have a lot of concerns. Mm -hmm. I think that's wise. Mm -hmm. I'd say. So we need a motion to deny the permit. I move that we deny the permit. Second. Moved and seconded. Merkin. Aye. Pedans. Aye. Basil. Aye. Thanks, Thank Dan. you. Do we have the pro a new proclamation? Thank you. So we're just going to read that one. Okay. Let's start over. Yeah. Yeah. Still? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're going to read the proclamation again. Whereas International Overdose Awareness Day is recognized globally on August 31st to raise awareness about the risk of overdosing, honor the special someone whose life has been lost from overdosing and acknowledge the grief felt by families, friends, and communities around the world. And whereas Over Overdose Awareness Day aims to publicly challenge the stigma associated with substance abuse disorders and overdosing. And whereas overdose claimed the lives of more than 475 Iowa residents in 2021, as well as countless others who will be affected forever. And whereas every person's life is valuable and every overdose death is preventable. It is imperative to recognize overdose as a social issue which impacts victims, their families, friends, and communities, and. Whereas Story County is calling on all communities, the state, and the country to support overdose prevention policies and projects and to work together to end the stigma and silence surrounding substance abuse and overdose. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Story County Board of Supervisors, do hereby proclaim August 31st, 2023, as International Overdose Awareness Day. I move the proclamation. Second. Moved and second. Pedans. Aye. Merkin. Aye. Basil. Aye. Uh, I also want to take a moment to read a statement um, that was provided to us by Tasha Taronis. Um, International Overdose Awareness Day is recognized on August 31st annually to continually make space and show support for the families in our community and around our country who have lost their special someone to an overdose. By recognizing this special event every year, we as a community are proclaiming that no one walks alone. We're creating an environment of community support and being a part of ending the stigma and silence that surrounds substance use and substance use disorder. Please join our community members and families on August 31st by tying a purple ribbon around a tree and or placing a purple light bulb in your outdoor light fixture for the evening. By doing this, you'll be showing all of our families that step into these ugly shoes every day that you are pausing alongside each one of us with empathy in your heart. You'll be showing us that our special someones matter. The significant piece to all of this is you being a part of ending the stigma and silence that surrounds our lost loved ones. All of our families work very hard on the front lines of this epidemic that shows no sign of ending anytime soon. In 2022 alone, data shows we've lost more than 109,000 lives. Their lives matter and still do. Tasha works hard to honor her beautiful, courageous, loving daughter, Tashara Burnside, who lost her life at the young age of 25 to an accidental overdose in Ames on December 17, 2020, 2016. She'll continue to fight our country's opioid crisis and make sure Tarsha is never forget forgotten. Thank you. Would you like to do a picture with the proclamation?
Moving next to discussion and consideration for attorney's office for an additional victim witness coordinator position. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. And you're just going to want to make sure you talk directly into the microphone, okay. even though you sound loud to yourself. So thanks for taking the time to meet with us this morning. Um, as you know, about three years ago, or a little over three years ago, the board authorized uh, full-time victim witness coordinator for our office. Um, and that program has gone well. Um, recently, we applied for and were authorized for a grant for $50,000 a year for three years to hire uh, a second full-time victim witness coordinator in our office. Um, we feel that um, this will help us complete our mission of serving victims. We have certain statutory duties, as you probably are aware of, victim notification, victim assistance, and... Uh, gathering restitution and information and so forth. Um, if we, we have broken down the figures for you that of what it would cost and we would need an approximate $40,000 more to fund the position. And so um, that's what we're asking the board for. Um, some statistics, currently we have um, 693 active criminal cases in our office. Um, that's about 70 per attorney, um, 431 of those cases are victim cases, and we have one full-time victim witness coordinator who handles the initial start of all those cases, and she assigns them to um, interns. We typically have three interns. Um, Nicole is our full-time victim witness coordinator, and she handles all of the domestic assault, sexual assault, and violent crime cases. And we also have a quarter-time legal, uh, a quarter-time victim witness person who's also a full-time legal assistant, and um, she's had to put in about 55 hours of comp time over the past year, to make sure her legal assistant duties are completed as well as the victim witness duties. We've had kind of an influx recently. You may have noticed of high-profile, complicated cases that are coming through our office, and. Um, Sam Betts, um, she's our most experienced legal assistant, and she puts a lot of time in working on those cases um, because they have to prepare the trial informations and the charging documents and so forth. Um, and I can't go into the specifics of the cases, but um, she's lately been putting a lot of time in on that and so has been able to devote less time to her victim witness duties. Um, our office has the capability of doing four trials in one week, which means that if we have one full-time victim witness quarter helping with one trial, then we need to rely on other office staff to fill in. So it would help our office a lot in fulfilling our duties to victims if we could create another position. Um, partially funded, it's $50,000 a year from the state for three years on a renewable grant. And this grant would work the same as our current grant we have for our VAWA prosecutor, domestic prosecutor, which I've been here 17 years and I've been doing that grant since I've been here and we've been funded the entire time um, by completing all the steps that we need to make to continue with that grant. I don't see it being an issue with this, this money continuing after the three year cycle. Um, if this is something that we don't take from them now, then we have to wait another three years to apply again for another position. So it's either um, we tell them, yes, we will be able to use this funding or we wait another three years to reevaluate on that. I will say that um, when I did all my training for the grants this year, 
they prepared us that there was going to be a lot of budget cuts and not sure they're going to be able to provide monies. And so I was shocked that they gave us $50,000 a year. I do think it has a lot to do with the Iowa Attorney General's office. Um, anytime there's a victim witness training, they reach out to Nicole. Um, other counties reach out to Nicole to ask how our county is handling victim cases. And I think it shows throughout the state. And so I do think that has a big impact on why they want us to have another full-time victim witness. What did you request for funding in this grant proposal? Did you request all the... So the $50,000 is salary funded, but um, the minimum amount of victim witness starts at 54 on the scale here. Okay. So we would need benefits to be funded and then the remaining part but of this. Did you submit a grant application for this position? Yes. Did you not ask for the benefits or did they say 50,000 was all you could get? 50,000 was all we could get. I asked for a full, full-time victim witness funded position and they, they're offering us $50,000. Okay. They, knowing that's not, okay. So was 50,000 the max you could? No, no, no. Okay. I, and usually it's, it's very rare for anybody to get a max amount when applying for a grant through the state. Um, I laid it all out on what exactly we would need and they came back with 50,000. Gotcha. Okay. So did you have a dollar amount that you requested? Um, I showed them the pay scale of a victim witness coordinator on our, on the grant. Mm -hmm. So I showed them like, you know, what that position would, would pay. They would, they would not give benefits if that, so. That's the question. Yeah. So grant money, they usually would not then give you more money to cover benefits because we have to show a match amount. And so our match amount would be showing that the county is, is giving benefit funds to match what they're giving for salary funds. And this is state funding, yes. not, not federal funding. Correct. Right. Through ODCP? I have Attorney General's office. Oh, it's Attorney General's, excuse me. Let's see. What's that? So. I contacted Alyssa and she provided me with the the max total benefits amount, what would be for a starting salary of the 54,000 victim witness. So that's the base on the scale. Um, and then, so she just came up with, if somebody were to come in and, and need the max amount of benefits, so. So the one victim witness coordinator we have now, is that position now on general funds or is it still on grant funds? That's general funds. It's all general, it okay. Is. So what you're asking for is just the $39,385.82. Correct. Is that correct? Correct. And you're anticipating a three year, three years of funding at the 50,000 level? That's guaranteed. Okay. So it, the 39 would go up next year because there would probably be some salary adjustments and benefit adjustments. So it would be, it could go up higher mm -hmm. if the 50 is fixed. Okay. And what... What is the impact? I guess I'm kind of asking Alyssa in the back. What's the impact if the grant for some reason does not get renewed? What is this a temporary position? Is this a permanent position that if grant funding does not get renewed in three years, what does that look like? Yeah, if you could, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, since it's a three-year grant, I would recommend putting it on as a full-time position. That is, you know, we're not going to, we don't want to advertise it as a temporary position. You have three years of funding. In three years, if there is no funding, then during budget work sessions, that would be a conversation that the board at that, you know, would have with the attorney's office at that time. Do we want to continue funding it at a hundred percent? You know, okay. you know, here's the value. Here's what we're able to provide with two full-time. That That's how I see it. Um, the benefits cost is the max. That would be an employee choosing family insurance. And that's how I always build out um, employment costs because we won't know until they fill that position what, and that could change from year to year. 
And yes, there would be salary increases, step increases, cost of living. Um, the 50,000 is a good portion of the salary. And we don't see that very often in um, positions. And I agree, typically we don't get a hundred percent. It's kind of rare unless it's a, you know, a federal program where they want to fund benefits and everything. Right. Um, but it is to offset those costs, but yes, the employer still has some costs to bring on that full-time employee. So. Okay. Thanks. I guess that was, I don't know if that's helpful. Is it, is it a temporary? It would be a permanent it... authorization of a position, okay. but if for some reason there would not be funding after the three years, then that might be a conversation that the board wants to have mm-hmm. during budget work sessions. You know what? We lost this revenue. What are we, Perfect. what do we want to do? Well, so. we're also facing a fiscal year where we may lose more general fund revenue. Yeah. That's that's also my concern okay. is whether we could keep the position for three years if the legislature does more to us of what they we don't even know the act. We don't even know the truly what we're gonna lose from what the legislature did last year. That's my concern. Now understand benefits are paid out of the supplemental fund. Pardon? The benefits are paid out of the supplemental. Yeah, which I know, but I mean, there is such supplemental, but they talked about touching supplemental. So So maybe that's what they're doing next year. That's my concern. So I guess if if we were to approve it, it would be under the understanding that we would hope to be able to continue it next year, but there really aren't guarantees because of just the general uncertainty. So we, can do that. we can do that. It's a three-year grant. Yeah. You got to make a commitment for the three years or they're without it. Yeah. For three years. Correct. You do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they've got guaranteed funding for three years and that's what they're asking for us to that's fund the a, match. for. Three I have years. a hard time doing that right now, given, given where we are. The revenue source. So I, I don't doubt the need for the position at all, but I have a hard time saying we're going to make a three-year commitment for this money because that means if we are losing more money, we have to take more elsewhere. Or maybe positions that have been around longer maybe are more needed. And I'm not saying this position is not needed, but I have some concerns about a three-year commitment. So I'm glad you brought it up. Um, yeah, I, I have concerns about not funding it, like being granted the, being awarded the opportunity for a position that is largely paid through a grant and turning it down. Um, And as someone who started it with the county in the victim witness program, I, I know I'm bringing some of my own personal experience into this, but I know how very important that position is for victims, for the running of the office, um, for all the work that happens in there and um, the, the type of offenses that we're seeing come through Story County are not getting any less serious. They're getting more serious. And if you have one person who's responsible for all the homicide, all the domestic, all of the victim crimes. So that would include all of the property crime and financial crimes and everything that has an impact on a person. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to burn out that one person. They're not going to be able to serve the victims that they're supposed to be serving at the level that those people deserve to be served at. And we're not doing justice to to the victims. Can can I ask a question? Yes. Do you have um, comparables from other counties, counties that have similar number of criminal filings, criminal court filings, and what they have for staff for victim witness coordinators? I did not put put that together. I'm more than willing to do that, though, and put that together. Okay. In the past, our office had three full-time victim Our office had three full-time victim witness coordinators. Um, Previous administration um, eliminated those positions. And I think that was a great mistake. And I think it was a big improvement when the board granted us have at least one victim witness coordinator instead of relying on 
part-time people and interns to fulfill those duties. Um, and having another full-time victim witness coordinator wouldn't bring us back to where we were 10 years ago, but it would be a significant improvement in services um, as well as um, not putting that burden all on one person to manage all of that. I agree with you. That was a mistake. I was when the positions were down before, and I was supportive of bringing one back. I'm sorry about the issue right now in terms of our funding and the uncertainty of funding right now. Um, we started the year with kind of a commitment that we were not increasing any more permanent positions for this year. We've already gone back on that once and I'm also worried about how many more when we're trying to hold a line and say we need to get a better sense of what our finances are going to look at long term I'm concerned that we're going down a path where we're going to make some commitments that hopefully I would hope we wouldn't regret them next spring but I'm afraid that we could be likely to I think when you're looking at safety and victims um there's a reason to put an investment okay. towards that's that. I mean, that's just kind of where I'm feeling on that. I'm also um, looking at, you do have a match from the state and there's no guarantee after three years that the state won't say they are going to lessen the amount of money or renege on that. Um, and this is an opportunity now to utilize those funds to help support the people that you serve. Three years from now, because of the state's actions, it may force us to say, no, we cannot fund all of it. But we've got an opportunity at this time where we could, where we could fund it. We're not going to feel the we're not going to feel the impact in three years. We're going to feel the impact next year. That's but my concern. This is also an off ramp. So if we do feel the impact next year, we do not have to renew the position in three years. So we have to find two years more of funding, even if we have our backs up against the wall on the revenues. Yeah, I don't expect that we'll have our backs up against the wall, um, $40,000 up against the wall. Well, it's it's 40 to find. And then it's, you're finding it from other existing positions, probably. That's all. I don't disagree. It's an important position. I just regret the timing. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, I am going to make a motion to approve the additional victims with witness coordinator position um, with the benefits funded by the county. Is that all that you would need, Alyssa's benefits or the additional salary amount? Just authorizing, Just authorizing the position. Yeah. Okay. And funding. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Headens. Aye. Basil, I, Merkin, nay. Thank you. Thank you, board. Thank you. Moving next to consideration of request for match for broadband grants. Supervisor Merkin. Okay. Excuse me, I lost my agenda. Let me get back to it. This is simply um, when I brought the request to us, um, we brought it a couple of weeks ago. Marcus, do you want to come up here? Yep. Are you prepared to discuss this? I mean, it hasn't really changed since two weeks ago. We just got a few it's updated numbers. numbers but, you go ahead. Uh, so this is the request from a few weeks ago. At that time, we didn't have as fine numbers as what we have now. We've had a couple of meetings with the various different, with COLO and with ICS, and kind of fine-tuned some of the numbers came up with over 160 for um, Biz 12, which is the one that's kind of centrally located in Story County. They'd be able to serve about 160 is their proposal. And then for Biz 62, uh, the Story County side of things, because that's that joint application with Boone County, we'd be at over 200 people getting services to bring them up to broadband standards, whether they're underserved right now or unserved. Um, are those are those identified 
people or just with, with the numbers we have, we know that would cover 160 or 200 people. Or this health. is only based on the identified from the results of the surveys, the OCIO and all of that. Now, if they go by another property that wasn't on the list for one reason or another, um, those individuals would have, to our understanding, both um, providers would be able to connect them at that time. Um, but that doesn't identify any where we went and looked and was like, oh, well, there's a house here that maybe they don't have. Mm -hmm. It's just from the OCIO because that's all that OCIO fund is based on these points. And that map, it's to our understanding, is shut down. They're not really taking any more adjustments. Um, but the potential is there. I'm sorry to cut you off. No, you're good. The, the potential is there to actually serve. It could be more, more than what, what this right? looks that's like from here. Kind of where... Um, the part of that recommendation for that hundred thousand dollars is that installation fees kind of helping with low to moderate income households as they go by they weren't on the list for one reason or another but some of those funds would be matched to help those individuals connect because that i mean that's a big expense right up front for most people just right right to come up with right so yeah, so it would be fiber would be going past their house, but not to the door. Yeah. Because you can't, you, if they're not on the OCO map and we tried, we said, hey, we know people. We know places that didn't get on that map. And they said, mm -hmm. too bad. Mm -hmm. That's it. So they would have to pay their own to get the fiber from the right away, you know, from the line to their door, so, which can be pricey. So, so this request is to offset that. So that's how people three is. Yeah. 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 Reserve the rest of the hundred thousand. We'd be reserving forty thousand because we're saying we're matching up to thirty thousand and they're gonna get thirty thousand if they get with mm -hmm. the number of locations. Yeah. And are you gonna have are you looking at with number three then having like a grant process or some sort of process so folks as you're going by with that additional that, that's what that 40,000 is, is to help out with those people that weren't on OCIO's list. Right. So they can't be part of this other part of the funding, but right. to help offset their connection costs. Right. But I, I guess my question is, how are you the build identifying out. and then fund, to... funding, funding that? I mean, I understand the funding's on here, but is the funding just going to go directly to the installer? I'm, I'm, we Or that still need to be flushed out? Okay. Yeah. This money has to be spent, the OCO's money has to be spent by December 2026. We have lots of time to figure out how we're going to do this. And we just didn't take the time now because we were working on getting letters of support and looking at getting the funding requests in right now. We've got, we've got a couple, we've got plenty of time to figure out how we'll do that. We know we'll want it to have some kind of means test. So yeah. But yeah. we also want it Not to be a simple point. process. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we'll work on it. Yeah, that, that that answers my question then. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. I don't either. I can make the motion to approve the request for match for the broadband for the broadband broadband grants as presented. Second. Moved and seconded. Hedens. Aye. Merkin. Aye. Basil, aye. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Marcus. And thank you, Supervisor Merkin. I know you spent a lot, a lot of time, you and, and many others, um, Leanne and others. Um, yeah, we've working. had a lot of people working on this yeah. and our service providers have been great to work with. So. And um, they're, we're, they're still in the process. They've still got another week, I think a little over a week to get everything in, but we've got a lot of letters to support. And... Um, and I know Leanne's meeting with one of the service providers this afternoon to help with the grant. So, and Caleb Knudsen from MEPA is helping with the Boone Story grant. So, got a lot of, and Greg Piccolap has done a lot of work with it too. So, it's a good team. Yes. And a lot of good work, good work done. Hopefully, we'll just get the money. Yeah. 
Okay, moving next to discussion and consideration of resolution 24-16, work and subdivision. Morning, Andrea. Still morning, yay. Before you say anything, I'm gonna recuse myself from discussion and vote. It's not me, it's my cousin, but thank you. quiet now. Okay, so we received a request for a residential parcel subdivision for a property on George W. Carver owned by Jeffrey and Cheryl Merkin. Their son, Ian Merkin, was the applicant on this subdivision request and has plans to build a home on the second lot that is created if this subdivision is approved. Um, so this is entirely located in the A1 Agricultural District, as is um, required for residential parcel subdivisions. So location, um, you can see that gold star on the left-hand picture. It is almost near the top of the county. Um, again, it's, it's near 110th Street and George W. Carver. You can see it highlighted in aqua on the right-hand picture, and it does contain a significant amount of floodplain, as you can see in the shaded dark blue area. So this is the proposed division. You can see lot two in the northeast corner. It's about three net acres, and that is where a second home would be built if this is approved. And then lot one is the remainder of this 40 acre piece. Um, and you can see on there the stream easement that was granted by the property owners and shown by the surveyor on the plat. It does conform to our new belt width method that we adopted in May. So this stream easement is significantly wider than what we used to see on residential parcel subdivisions because this uh, particular reach of the stream does meander. And so you draw a straight line on those opposing bends and then you measure 50 feet off of that. So it does cover quite a bit of ground. Um, and so yeah, proposed lot one, it has the existing house, the existing farmstead, ag buildings, pasture ground for cattle. And then proposed lot two is just currently used for a hay field. The stream easement um, I have spoken about already. So again, you know, it conforms with our, our current new standards. Um, we do have a written easement agreement that will be recorded with the subdivision plat. County Conservation, they did complete a site review of this property. It is mapped, the majority of the property is mapped as a natural resources area. Part of that is because of the floodplain, but also because there is no known cropping history of what is west of that stream branch. So conservation had some you know, suspicions that it was remnant prairie. They did do a site review. In Appendix A of the staff report, I provided Mike Cox, the Director of County Conservation, I provided his comments on what vegetation he and one of the naturalists found on site. Um, while there was some conserva conservation value to what they found on site, they didn't feel that it was um, sufficient or kind of to use Mike's verbiage, it didn't get to the tipping point of conditioning a conservation easement on the subdivision plat. Um, so this information is going to be provided to the applicant, to the property owners, if they want to consider a voluntary easement later or want more information from conservation on restoration practices for that area west of the stream. The floodplain regulations, um, you know, we don't have base flood elevation data back yet from the Iowa DNR. I did request it a couple of months ago now, but it takes a while to get back. So because of that, the surveyor has put two notes on the plat that no zoning permits can be issued until we have that information and also letting individuals know that planning and development will have that BFE data. The regulations for the residential parcel subdivision, again, they have to be, you know, the lots created have to be used for residential purposes, has to be entirely contained within the A1 zoning district and already have at least one existing house on the property. Um, and you all are familiar with these. And let's see, yeah, no variances from subdivision standards were granted um, and their the lot size is met for each lot one and lot two. Comments from the public, I did mail out notification letters on the 15th, and I also placed a sign on the property letting passersby know that a subdivision had been proposed, maximum of two lots. We have not gotten any public comments. Um, we did have a gentleman stop down at the office just before this meeting and is present, just you know, wanted to see what the subdivision was about, um, but didn't provide any public comment in the office. So analysis, um, you know, all requirements for the subdivision type are met. We have the required stream easement. 
the applicant confirmed that Xenia Rural Water can provide service and they can get electrical service from Story City Municipal. And then they'll be getting natural gas from Key Co-op. So alternatives, staff is recommending that you approve resolution 24-16 for the Merkin Residential Parcel Subdivision. You can also vote to deny it or table it. Any questions? I just had one question. It was a few slides back and I thought you said something about permits not being allowed or not needed. Oh, for the base flood. So until we get the base flood elevation data back from the Iowa DNR, we will not issue a zoning permit for a house. So the property owner would have to wait for us to get that data back before they could get the permit in hand to build the dwelling. Got, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So in other words, building a house would be contingent Right, and we'll, yeah, we'll get the the BFE data back at some point. Um, it just takes them a while, and then we know if they need to elevate the house, if the house is completely outside that base flood elevation, we'll, we'll, we can look at the, the maps and make that determination. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I do not have any other questions. No, I don't have any other questions. Uh, with that, uh, I would approve resolution 24-16, the Merkin Residential Par Parcel Subdivision as submitted. Second, Hedens. Aye. Faisal, aye. And Merkin abstains. Thank you. Thank you. We have no departmental reports. Moving to other reports, discussion and direction on modification to the agreement with Story County Housing Trust for Story County Housing and Direct Care Program. Good morning, Leanne. Lucas is also available if you have any questions for it um, on behalf of the Story County Housing Trust. This is um, a request just for information today. The formal um, approval of the request will actually be in the form of an amendment to the agreement for the, the um, with the Story County Housing Trust and Story County Board of Supervisors. Uh, just a reminder, the board awarded $470,000 to the Story County Housing Trust. Um, that was for uh, a, um, programs that had three elements, one um, for direct care worker stipend, which is why I'm here today. Um, also for purchase of a Homes for Iowa house. And then also um, monies towards first time home buyer assistance. Through our Housing Action Plan Committee work as well, the Story County Housing Trust and then project management for ARPA, um, some discussions occurred. One, we became aware uh, from guidance from the U.S. Treasury that the stipend program really fit into the premium pay, um, and that, as you well know, ceased. So that stipend could no longer be used in that manner, and they had not yet, they being the Story County Housing Trust, had not yet formalized that program. Um, with that, and then um, the Iowa, the first time home buyers program, we have found that there are only a couple lenders that participate in IFA's first time home buyer program in Story County. So our housing assessment um, action group or staff working group has been working on that. And so um, we're trying to find a different solution than IFA. However, this application is tied to IFA. So you have a hundred some thousand for the um, stipend program, and then a hundred thousand for the IFA home buyer assistance. That may not be able to meet that 2026 deadline that we have because these are ARPA funds. So the Story County Housing Trust asked, and this is laid out in Lucas's letter, that the monies for the direct care stipend um, be reallocated towards purchase of a home, uh, another home for Homes for Iowa, and then 50,000 or 55,000 of that first time home buyer assistance program also be reallocated to go towards the Homes for Iowa purchase. That would be allowed for a second Homes for Iowa purchase for the Story County Housing Trust. Bots have been identified and I think purchased um, in Nevada and McCallsburg for placement of Homes for Iowa. Um, I think allowing $50,000 still for the first time home buyer program, since it's tied to the IFA program is adequate at this time. There are too many unknowns 
really with the IFA, Iowa Finance Authority's Home Buyer Assistance Program, given that there's only two lenders that are participating in Story County. So if you look at the next three years, $50,000, that might even be challenged to be able to go through that fund. We know we can get Homes for Iowa House in. For 155? Um, 165. I was thinking 190 was the number we were using before. I, I think that's because there was we were thinking about buying lots. a lot. Lots. Already got their lots from other yeah. sources. Okay, that probably works. Lucas, are you available? Yeah, I am. Could you answer Linda's question about the cost of the home? Yeah, so ultimately any cost that isn't covered um, through these funds will be covered through the Story County Housing Trust award monies um, that we are allocated from the state. Thank you. So I, I brought this to you today for just some discussion and direction. Um, if this is an approach that is um, to which the board thinks would be a, a it would be a good approach, um, I'll draft an amendment to the agreement. You've seen a couple of them already, um, and then that will be on your consent agenda after the Story County Housing Trust has taken action on it and approved it. I think it sounds like a much better um, likelihood of using the money. I'm still concerned about the fifty thousand. Yes. And that I, I think because, um, again, we're working on this with the housing action plan aspect as well, uh, we might be able to have some creative solutions beyond that, just the IFA. There might be another amendment to this coming forward to remove the IFA lenders too. Mm -hmm. okay. That's too early to know yet. Okay. Well, I think it's a good way to reallocate the funds that you cannot utilize in the original capacity mm -hmm. and keep it and keep the funds keep focused on housing. housing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, um, you don't need a motion to nope. give you direction. Mm -hmm. I got the okay. direction. I'll be back mm -hmm. hopefully next week or the following with the action item on your consent agenda uh, with the item on your consent agenda. Thank you. I can't say broad of bandy either today, so. <laughs> Tongue twister today. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Lynn. All right, any upcoming agenda items? I think so. Okay, now it's time for public comment number two, comments from the public on items not on this agenda. The board may not take any action on the comments due to requirements of open meetings law, but may do so in the future. Anyone wishing to make public comment, you can raise your hand on Zoom or step forward to the table. And seeing no one step forward or raise their hand, we'll close public comment number two and move to liaison assignments, committee meeting updates and announcements from the supervisors. Uh, Supervisor Merkin, you wanna go first? Sure. Um, tonight, hazardous mitigation planning meeting number three, and it's an in-person meeting. We'll be here in the public meeting room. I'll be attending that. Um, the rest of the week is Iowa State Association of Counties annual conference, so we'll be there, and I may have some other meetings this, on Friday afternoon if I get back in time. Saturday is the, the Overdose Awareness Day event at the Ames Band Show, I believe from 10 to noon, plan to be there, and that's it for the week. Great. Supervisor Hedden. Uh, yes, I'm going to attend the ribbon cutting for the Arc and Friendship Arc at their new location this afternoon. Um, yeah, um, then I also will be famous Supervisor Merkin at ISAC for the rest of the week and plan to attend the overdose awareness on Saturday. On Monday, I have a, a meeting at nine and then I have a, heard a meeting with their outreach coordinator at 11 and then a MICA meeting in the afternoon. So I don't know if I'll be in the office mon or on Monday or if I am, it'll be for a short time in the afternoon because I'm pretty full in the, in the morning. All right, pretty much the same thing, except um, I've got a SIRHA meeting tonight, so I won't be able to attend the hazard mitigation uh, meeting this evening. 
and then I'll be at the ISAC conference. Um, and next week was uh, planned vacation. I, I will be in and out next week because we're not going out of town like we planned. Um, Tuesday morning is um, entrance conference with the state auditor's office. So I will be here for that and I'll be here for the meeting on Tuesday also. Anything further? I move we adjourn. Second. Moved and seconded. Heddens. Aye. Merkin. Aye. Basil, aye. We're adjourned. Thank you.